So like you heard, my name is Kazmer DeCasatis, former IBM Distinguished Engineer for many years. Now I work for the New York State Center for Cloud Computing and Analytics at Marist College. Today I'm going to give you a little demo about how we do automated SDN NFV management. So what I'm going to show you is some code that we've written to some open APIs that allows us to manage networks inside a data center and networks between multiple data centers on the WAN using an SDN controller. I'm going to show you how we've automated that so that we do bandwidth monitoring on the optical transport ring and then based on the bandwidth utilization we have a policy that automatically adjusts by adding or removing provisioned optical wavelengths. We built all of this at our test bed in upstate New York so I'll show you the configuration, I'll show you the software stack, and then I have a short video which will hopefully work, fingers crossed, and I'll be able to show you some of the results. Now, before I get into all of that, if you've heard me talk earlier in the week, you know the deal, I've got to take a minute and thank the people who paid for my plane ticket out here. So I work for Marist College. Uh, we're in upstate New York, about an hour and a half north of New York City, we have about 6,000 undergraduates, but 1,000 graduate students. And uh, several years ago, uh, the governor of the state of New York gave us a $3 million grant and named us as the New York State Center for Cloud Computing and Analytics. So if you want to do cloud research in New York State, you come to us. We have academic partnerships with the city and state universities of New York, Columbia University, Caltech, and a couple other places. We have industry sponsors that include Cisco, IBM, Adva, Siena, Brocade, Plexi, and a whole bunch of others. You may have seen our code at CERN Labs. It runs part of their demo things with a super collider. You may have seen us at VMworld or SDN NFV World Congress in Germany or even at Internet2. Uh, we're an Internet2 member. We're in the process of building a dark fiber, 100 kilometer, 100 gigabit link between our campus and New York City so we can branch off to a peering point and go to longer distance cloud networks. So thank you Marist for supporting all of this. When I talk about automated provisioning, it comes back to cloud service providers. And if you heard my breakout session on Monday, Cloudy with a Chance of SDN, you saw a slide very much like this one. The problem you have as a service provider today is that every time you add a new customer, you're losing a little bit of money. Revenue's not keeping up with traffic volumes. We got two ways to fix this. One is the down arrow, you lower costs. That means you've got to automate things that you're doing manually today, lowering your OPEX, hopefully get better efficiencies out of the system, which means you also don't have to buy as many boxes, so that reduces your CapEx. The other way to fix it is the upward arrow. Add new features and functions that you can charge for. It turns out that SDN is pretty good at this too. The automated provisioning I'm going to show you opens up new opportunities for things like disaster recovery. And we have some use cases we're working with clients in uh, Wall Street in New York City to deal with that. Now the network is a really good place to focus for virtualization because most networks today are highly over-provisioned and therefore very inefficient. Optical networks in particular tend to run about 30% utilization on a good day. That means that it is extremely expensive to put in an optical network that gives you high quality of service. You've got to over-provision everything by a factor of three or more. If we could automate that process so that instead of taking days or weeks to provision an optical wavelength, I could do it in 60 seconds, then I'd have a much different cost model. I could charge people based on their utilization of capacity out of a wavelength pool. I could also do things like backup and recovery. So we have a lot of clients in New York City that we work with, like Morgan Stanley, Prudential, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and they have regional data centers. They would like to run those in a load balance configuration during the day, both inside their data centers and across their WAN. Then, at night, they'd like to switch over into a backup and recovery configuration like this. Switch all the bandwidth for backup and recovery, and then eight hours later, shift it all back again. You can go to any service provider that you like in the New York City area and ask them to write you an SLA to do this. When they get done laughing at you, 
they will tell you that it is impossible for them to dynamically reprovision their WAN once every eight hours. They don't have the tools for it. Well, if you can't do that, you can't do a whole bunch of other useful things either. For instance, maybe you've heard that Hurricane Sandy is coming up the East Coast like it did a few years ago. One of our big clients, Verizon, almost lost their pop in northern New Jersey. I talked about this on Monday in my breakout. Why did they almost lose it? Because they protected their data center with this real high-tech disaster recovery strategy called sandbags. And if we'd gotten six inches more rain, it would have knocked out all the traffic in northern Jersey. So here you've got a company that literally owns the network that has 24 hours notice a hurricane's coming. Why didn't they just reprovision the whole thing and move all their data 100 miles inland? You can't reprovision a man or a wham that fast today. It's just not done. Well, we built a solution around this, and we talked about it at Internet 2. So I've referenced the full paper on the slides and in my backup if you want the details. Think about if you were the first service provider in any major metropolitan city who could offer a guarantee that if a hurricane was coming and you got 24 hours notice, nobody loses any data. That would be a game changer. That's one of the things we're trying to enable with automated provisioning. Now, not only do I want to reprovision the network on a scale of hours, I want to provision on a scale of minutes, like I do with virtual machines. So this is another slide from my presentation on Monday. I know you still can't read the access. Don't worry about that. This is real client data. We're monitoring traffic at a customer who's doing synchronous storage backup from their private enterprise data center into the public cloud. You'll notice it's very bursty traffic. There's a lot of spikes going on here. There's one big spike there on the left that goes off the top of my graph that lasts about 20 or 30 minutes. Now, how do you solve the problem of bandwidth spikes in your traffic pattern? Well, if you're this client, you try to do it with static provisioning. The three horizontal lines show them adding 50% more static bandwidth year after year after year. Three years into it, they still haven't been able to get over those spikes. Their performance is still bad, and it's costing them more and more money. You cannot cost effectively solve problems like this with static provisioning. It would be much better if you could detect when one of those spikes was going to hit, reprovision some bandwidth out of a wavelength pool that you've set up, ride through the spike, and then deprovision it again when you're done. Uh, so we can do that, provided that we can reprovision the wavelengths roughly 60 second time intervals. That's what we're going to show you today. Now this slide shows you the stack that I have inside my lab in New York. Uh, we're running both KVM and VMware environments. Uh, we have uh, orchestrator sitting on top that runs the different applications like disaster recovery. We have OpenStack middleware sitting in there. Coming out of the Neutron interface, we have our network controllers. We prefer open source controllers like Open Daylight or like the Floodlight controller from Big Switch. The Open Daylight controller was heavily funded by Cisco. So most of the code in Open Daylight that does interesting things is compatible with the Cisco controller. I could just as easily swap a Cisco branded controller in there. I partitioned the physical network so if I wanted to, I could have different virtual slices. So I'm a service provider. I carve up the network using my controller and I give each tenant their own slice of bandwidth. Then I tell the tenants, you can pick a controller of your own. I don't care what it is. It doesn't have to be the same one I use to slice the network. And you can provision your slice of bandwidth any way that you want. So if you want to use Floodlight and I sliced it with Open Daylight, that's fine. If you want to use Cisco or some other vendor solution, that's fine as well. So we're big believers in open source, big believers in multi-vendor interop. This is the physical infrastructure that we used for the demo. So I have a metro optical ring, 125 kilometers around. I have three sites on the ring, which I have cleverly named A, B, and C. At each one of those sites, I have ADVA, FSP 3000 optical transport. So that gives me my optical ring. I also have some Sienna Metro Ethernet gear in here, which is not on the slide, but we do use it. Every one of those sites 
has some IBM servers, a couple of terabytes of storage, and a mixture of switches from different vendors. So I've got some Cisco gear in there, some old Catalyst, some 6500, some other stuff. I've got some Plexi boxes, they're a startup. I've got some IBM Lenovo branded switches, some brocade, a couple of other things as well. All the switches speak OpenFlow, so they all talk to an Open Daylight controller. The optical boxes do not speak OpenFlow natively. They speak SNMP, but I have a network hypervisor that translates SNMP with a custom MIB into OpenFlow. So now I can have an OpenFlow southbound interface going up to my controller, and I can have one controller that runs the optical network as well as the network inside each one of those three data centers. I know, I'm excited about it too, right? So, oh dear, ring the gong when you get to 70 gigabytes. Anyway, this network also has dynamic bandwidth monitoring. So every Adva box is a shelf that costs you about half a million dollars. There's a card that costs about a hundred bucks that I plug into that shelf. Basically, it's an x86 engine. I can use it as a traffic generator to send test patterns. I can also use that card to do bandwidth monitoring. So I'm going to be measuring the traffic that goes around those nodes. That feeds back into my controller. And I've written a script in Python that has a match action table and tells me what I have to do if I see the bandwidth getting too big or too small. And I can automatically reprovision the thing without any human intervention. So that's what I'm going to show you in my demo coming up next. Give me a second here to switch over to the video that I've made. I've got about an eight minute long video that hopefully will play now. Please go up there. OK. And it's not showing. Wonderful. OK. Can I get a little tech support, please? Hmm. We had that problem this morning. And I thought I had licked it, but apparently no luck. Yeah, it's showing up on here. It's not showing up on there. I don't know why. So while we try to share my screen, or maybe extend my screen so it covers both this and that, I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, we were obviously brought into this problem by some customers that we have in the New York City area that are trying to do what I said on my earlier slide. They want to be able to dynamically provision their network multiple times a day, and in some cases they want to ride through bursts in the network. Oh, there we go. That's a little more promising. There it goes. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And let's see. Are we playing the video? Let's start the video. There she goes. OK. So what you see here is the open daylight management screen. Nothing fancy. We have abstracted that optical ring so it looks like just one box in the middle. In a second, I'm going to show you that spinning up into my three node optical network. But for now, I've got three nodes. They all have four 10 gigabit links interconnecting them to that optical ring, and I've got a little thermometer bar here on the right hand side that shows how much traffic I'm pushing across this network. So as we go through the demo, I'll periodically click on that bar and you'll see more and more traffic and you'll see the network respond. In the left hand pane over here, I can see the topology in detail or I can click on the tab and show the flows that are going over this entire network. Now we've written some code to embed software inside Open Daylight that will spin up our optical management system. So I'm going to focus on that for now. I'm going to click on that and launch my optical manager from inside Open Daylight. My three node optical network spins up into place. Now I'm going to provision links by clicking and dragging between the nodes that I want to connect. In reality, you could do this using a script of your own. I'm going to do it manually just to show you how it works. So let's say that I want to connect nodes A and B. I draw a link between them. 
I do one-click provisioning. It goes down and talks to the optical transport. The link will flash on and off for a second, and then it'll come up solid green. That shows me that that's physically provisioned and ready to carry traffic. And there it goes. And of course, I can go over and click in the flow pane and see that there are flows provisioned to go over it so everything is nice and consistent. Uh, I can also mouse over that link. And I don't know if you can see it when the graphic does that. But when you mouse over the link, it pulls up a little shorthand about how much traffic is being pushed and what the ID is and so on. So let's fire up the traffic generator. I'll push 5 gig over that link. Now, every optical link has a 10 gig capacity, so I'm doing just fine. The link stays green. Nobody cares. I'm doing really well. If I check my flows, you'll see that, in fact, yes, I am pushing 5 gig over the thing. Uh, I can go back in just a minute and click on my traffic generator again. And in a moment, I'm going to dial that back down to zero. And I'll show you that the flows respond accordingly. So I can push as much or as little traffic as I want and get real-time feedback onto that screen. Now, that should change in just a moment. You see it goes down to zero. Uh, the link stays green through all of this because it's a 10 gig link. It doesn't care if I'm pushing 5 gig of traffic over it. And I can go and click on the flow tables or the cache or anything else and pull up that detail. So having done that, we also wrote a policy that says if I'm pushing too much bandwidth and the network can't handle it, the policy says spin up another link, double the bandwidth. I'm going to show you that next. And it does that automatically. So first, I'm going to have to go in and enable bandwidth monitoring. So I jump over into the code that we wrote. I look at the cache. I see I've got enough cache. I click the tabs, and I turn on those little $100 cards that are monitoring traffic for me. And that screen should refresh momentarily. Here it comes. Now I am actively monitoring traffic. So now, let's push some traffic over the link and see if our policy works. Will it respond without manual intervention? Well, the thermometer bar is going to fire up here in just a second off to your right. Those are five gig increments if you can't read it from the back. So now it's gone up two clicks. I'm pushing 10 gig of traffic over a 10 gig link. The link is going to turn red. Say, wait a minute, you can't do that. The system says, what happens when I try to push 10 gig over a link and I can't handle it? Spin up another link. And that's exactly what it does. If you can see that from your seats, another link has appeared next to the red one. That one has turned green because it's got excess capacity. So the system automatically detected I was pushing 10 gig, checked the policy, went back and automatically provisioned itself double the bandwidth. I could have told it to do anything I want. I could have provisioned a different path, spun up additional nodes, whatever you want. I just tried to keep it nice and simple for purposes of this demo. So I've got a green link and a red one. When I dial the data back down, the system says, hey, I don't need two links anymore. It deprovisions one of them, takes it offline. The remaining link goes green, says it's provisioned and ready to carry traffic. So this is all automated. I'm not having to click on anything. I'm just turning the traffic generator on and off. Now, the policy that we wrote says, every time you get a link that goes red, I want you to go back and add additional capacity as long as it's available. So if I had more traffic than two links could stand, it would spin up a third one. I'm going to show you that next. So I start off with my one link. I push 10 gig over it. That's enough to trigger the system to automatically spin up a second link. I'm going to leave the first link red so you know it's over provisioned. Let's crank it up to 15 gig. Now, my first link stays red, as I told you. The second one goes from green to yellow. It says, well, I can still carry that 15 gig over a 20 gig channel, but it's marginal. You go much higher than this, you're going to be in trouble. So I have this nice little graphical heat map that shows me red, yellow, and green, what's going on. The automated system says, I'm going to leave those links in place because I can still carry it as long as one of them is yellow. In a minute, I'm going to crank the traffic all the way up to 20 gig. So now that's more than two links can carry. 
the system's going to detect that and it's going to go back and automatically spin up a third link for me. So in just a minute, you'll see the thermometer bar go up. The system detects that and says, hey, I've got two red links. Policy, what do I do? Policy says, give me another one as long as it's available. And of course it is. So we spin up a third link. That third link goes green. I can still carry the traffic. So all this is happening as I'm talking. It just takes a few seconds to reprovision an optical wavelength over that 50 kilometer span. Now I'm going to dial this back down to zero in a minute and show you that it automatically takes channels away without my having to touch it. So you can see that with something like this, I could ride through those traffic bursts like the ones I was showing you on my earlier slide as long as I could detect that the burst was coming, suddenly I don't have the capacity, I can very quickly spin up more wavelengths. I can do the same thing for switches inside my data center. I don't have the time to show you that. Frankly, it's a little boring, but I think that if you'll agree, if I can do it for an optical link, I should be able to do it for any old link inside my data center. Now, let's go back here. And uh, I'd like to show just one or two more slides before I wrap this up. <coughs> now, Cisco, <coughs> Cisco has actually implemented something relatively similar to this as part of the Evolved Services platform. So here you see Cisco ESP. The physical and virtual devices at the bottom are giving feedback up to these service profiles. So, I know how much capacity I've got, how many extra wavelengths, how much bandwidth, all that good information. I also have applications at the top that are pushing requests down. I need high availability, I need low latency, whatever my profile is. The orchestration engine in the middle is figuring out what paths are possible to spin up. And we do that through a whole range of different types of hardware and software. Uh, Cisco is using the Open Daylight Controller, just like I did. They're using OpenStack middleware just like I did. About two weeks ago, Cisco bought a company named Piston, which is a big OpenStack company. So you'll see more OpenStack content in the next year on this kind of a solution. Now, Cisco has implemented this as part of their service provider platforms. You can actually get this running in prototype form at many Cisco clients. So that research I showed you is pretty much ready for prime time. Uh, I talked about some of this on Monday, so I'm going to skip through it a little bit fast because I only have a few minutes left. But the ability to dynamically provision traffic inside a data center exists today. I've just shown you that I can spin up traffic between multiple data centers. Cisco's Evolve Elastic Wavelength Service is what they call it, will let you do the same thing on a long distance span. Uh, Cisco has implemented this at some customers. Telefonica is one of the early ones. So Telefonica is using the Evolved Services platform to run half of their network in Spain. It has that same basic architecture and feedback structure that I showed you a few minutes ago. All the stuff we wrote at Marist College is online, open source on our website. My slides and my presentation from Monday also have that background information if you want to look at it. Now, for those of you that are taking the CCNA, this is the kind of stuff that you're going to have to be doing to manage your network in the next few years. It's more than just memorizing commands and typing on the CLI. It's learning to write these very simple scripts in Python, which provision the automatic control on the network. I also happen to lead the SDN working group for ISSIP, International Society of Service Industry Professionals. So if you're a practitioner wanting to learn how this stuff works, ISSIP is a professional society sponsored by Cisco. It helps drive education, training, and research in these type of areas so that your jobs don't get obsoleted when we start to automate parts of the network. Finally, if I can do all of that and it works, the next step is to throw analytics into the mix. So we wrote some simple analytic models to validate what happens when you move virtual machines around. I talked about this in my breakout on Monday. 
The key point here is that you'll note that when I model virtual machine mobility on the network, it is highly nonlinear with bandwidth. So if I add just a little bandwidth, I can get a big improvement in migration time for certain workloads. Other workloads have migration time floors, like this dashed line. I could throw as much bandwidth as I want at that. Bandwidth isn't the limiting factor. I'll never move that dashed line VM in under 100 milliseconds. Won't happen. That's the kind of stuff I'd like to know inside my feedback control loop that I've just automated. So we're in the process of rolling that out right now. Cisco's got some neat tools that do that. And finally, finally, last slide, I promise. If I can do all of that for bandwidth policies and SLAs, why can't I write a policy for anything I want? Why can't I do automated security? If my application says I need higher security than someone else, I'll implement it automatically. I'll spin up NFV instances that do firewalls. I will do deep packet inspection if I detect that there's an incursion into the network because there's some deviation from nominal traffic. I'll use security analytics, maybe cognitive systems in that feedback loop. All of this is stuff we've got working in the test labs now. Probably will be ready to show you a much more compelling prime time demo on that next year. So I'm just about out of time. I have a whole set of references in the back of this deck if you want to look up the technical papers and the detail that we've done. You can follow me on Twitter. It's at Dr. Underscore Kazmer. The underscore is because I'm a computer science person. And you can look up my blog that I write every month for OFC, the Fiber Optics Conference. They're going to give me the hook in just a minute here. Let me thank you for showing up, and maybe I can take a few quick questions before we have to wrap up. I think there's a mic going around if anybody wants to ask a question. Yes. Hi. Uh, quick question. Uh, as a network engineer, I have a very basic uh, introduction with programming. OK. So what do you advise for the next five years for me if I want to come towards uh, SDN? What language I should learn? Okay. Which way I should proceed? So, so advice for practitioners about how to get into this automation and programming game? Usually, I recommend people start with Python. It's a dead simple language. It almost reads like conversational English. The only tricky thing about Python is it distinguishes between white spaces and tabs. That'll throw you off, so you've got to watch for that. Otherwise, it's very easy to read and learn. I'd jump on something like Code Academy and take a basic course in Python. Then I'd go and look at equipment from Cisco where they have APIs and sample scripts that you can look at or go to our website at Marist College and download some samples once you know a little bit of Python. Then you'll be able to see what we did, and then you can start playing with ways to customize it yourself. I think there's some other good programs here at Cisco Live that'll talk about APIs and Python as well. Anything else? No? Thank you very much, Casimir. That was a great presentation.